My guests are Willie Soon and a father-son team. We have Michael Connolly, the father, and Ronan Connolly, the son. Well, in this presentation, we're going to be talking about the methods used to detect global warming. Uh, then we we'll describe the techniques used to determine how much of this warming is, can be attributed to natural causes and how much is due to human causes. So I'm going to set the ball rolling by explaining how the UN uh, climate panel, the, the IPCC, does this. Then Roland's going to show the problems with their detection approach. We'll dis we'll discuss the problems with their attribution approach. And I'll finish up by explaining how our latest peer-reviewed work tries to resolve these problems and how these scientific papers uh, show that the IPCC's conclusions in their reports for policymakers was just a best premature. So for those of you who uh, don't know about the uh, IPCC, let me give you a bit of background. 35 years ago, the World's Meteorological Organization and the United Nations set up an organization called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC. The purpose of this organization was to provide the government at all levels with scientific information that they could use to develop climate policies. So over the last 35 years, they've published six reports. The main takeaway from these reports is that the observed global warming since at least the 1950s is mostly caused, uh, human caused and unprecedented. So how did they reach this conclusion? And is it scientifically justified? So let's consider the IPC's approach to the detection of global warming. In their AR4, in their AR6 report, they presented four time series estimates of how the global temperature has risen in the 19, since the 1850s. As you can see, it has risen by about one degree centigrade since the 19th century. This one degree rise is what people mean when they talk about global warming. Uh, these time series are based on thermometer records. That's important, right? And since we don't have thermometer records that go back for the last thousand years, thermometers weren't invented a thousand years ago. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to look at things called temperature proxies. Things like the growth of tree rings, the length of glaciers, lake sediments, that sort of thing. So in this graph, they compared the four of the average of those four temperature-based estimates to the proxy-based estimates for the last thousand years. They conclude then that uh, modern warming is unprecedented in at least the last two thousand years. So now we'll now we'll explain why they attribute this warming to humans. To do this, they use a, a computer modeling technique called hind casting. So a hind casting is the opposite of a forecast. To do a hind cast, they run computer models using different values of parameters, which are called radiative forcings, and they compare the results with past observations. Radius and forcings are factors that are known to change the temperature. If the sun were to get hotter, for example, so if one of the computer models can reproduce the temperature time series, they say the values of the forcings used in these models are correct. Uh, here we have the results of the hindcast for the last three reports. Uh, I'll just zoom in on the AR4 uh, report and explain the process. So let me just digress here for a minute. In the literature, there are lots of estimates of how the energy that the Earth gets from the sun varies over time. They're called TSI estimates. Willie will explain uh, why this is important. So let's just get back to the slide. Uh, in the graph labeled forcing, so you can see a lot of wavy blue lines. These are the outputs from the different computer models that only consider the effects of solar and volcanic forcings. The dark blue line is the average of them all. So, um, is that, that, that one's mentioned, yeah. yeah, so uh, if you can see here, uh, the dark blue line and the black wavy line diverge at around 1960 or thereabouts. With uh, uh, on the right-hand side, though, you can see uh, the wavy yellow lines. These are the computer estimates that include a human-caused forcing. 
Willie'll explain how they got these four things later. The red line is the average of all the yellow lines. Uh, you can see the red line and the black line do not diverge. Because these lines don't diverge, they conclude that humans are to blame for global warming. So uh, in AR6, they use six TSIs from the literature. In AR5, they used four. And in AR6, they used only one. Uh, I, and the divergence from uh, natural only forcings has become clearer. So is this analysis scientifically robust? Well, since AR5 was published, uh, we published 10 scientific papers that showed two major problems with their analysis. The first is the land components of their global temperature record, uh, and it is contaminated with urban heat island effects, which Ron is going to talk about. And the second is they use a small subset of the known TSI estimates, and Willie's going to address this. So for those of you that are interested, here are the uh, 10 papers that we published. So now I'm just going to hand it over to Ronan. I, uh, thanks, Michael, and thanks, Tom, for uh, inviting us to, have, uh, to share these results. So as Michael said, uh, I'm going to be looking at the problems with the detection process which is a bit about how to calculate global warming. Um, so the IPCC's global temperature estimates uh, from 1850 to present, these are the instrumental bits that Michael was mentioning. Uh, they're based on two components. You have the land surface temperatures, and they're based on weather station records from around the world. Then you have the sea surface temperatures. These are kind of happenstance things where if a ship was passing by in March 1862, and they took a sample of the water and they record the temperature. Then people say, oh, that's the temperature there. And then three months later, another ship is going by nearby. And, and so they average it in, together in that way, as opposed to having a fixed measurement. And then if one ship is taking the measurements from a big boat uh, or, you know, taking it from an engine room. They, they have different methods of doing it, but people are trying to correct for these complexities. Um, the main point I want to get here is that the weather, the land component is in some ways the most uh, systematic and scientific, but there is good sea surface temperature data as well. When Michael mentioned about the unprecedented bit, that comes from the temperature proxies. And it's worth remembering, temperature proxies are indirect measurements, like the tree ring width of the width of a tree ring. It depends on the summer temperature, but also the precipitation, the shading, uh, nutrients, a lot of different factors. So the other thing to remember with the temperature proxies is that they're using instrumental records to calibrate the temperature proxies. So the the start of all of this and the end of all of this is the land surface temperature. So this is the bit that we've been working on. And as Michael mentioned, this urbanization bias problem, this is the urban heat island. You, a lot of you probably are familiar with this already. If you're not familiar with it, say if you have a car and you have a thermometer on it in the car, if you drive into the city, into a city, and then you drive out, just have a look the next time on the dashboard. And you might notice that as you go into the city, it starts to get a bit warmer and then it gets colder if you leave the city. And this can be shown in lots of ways. Here we see satellite heat maps. This is from uh, NOAA provided this. And you can see this is for Washington, D.C. You can see the city area coincide with hotter areas. Now, uh, let's, if we, so urban heat islands, that is a climate change and it's human caused climate change, but it's nothing to do with greenhouse gases or any of the things that the UN is trying to reduce with their man-made climate change policies. This is a related to city effects. You have the concrete asphalt uh, surfaces, the shapes of the buildings, the uh, reduction in greening, of, of not as much green area, all of, not, all of these, a lot of complex factors, but we know cities are warmer than the surrounding countryside. We also know that cities, urban areas only represent 
three or four percent of the land and less than two percent of the planet. So, but they make up the vast majority of the thermometer stations are in areas that are now somewhat urbanized or fully urbanized. So when people are using these weather stations, urbanized weather stations for sampling global climate, they're not, they're sampling urban climate. That's only 2% of the global planet. And this is our most robust estimate. And the other point to mention is that more than half of the world's population live in urban areas. And um, so you, you, they actually, if, if you're living in a, an urban or suburban area, which is most people, you are actually experiencing human caused climate change from urbanization. But this is a local urbanization effect. And if you want to look at global climate change, you have to separate that urban component, that urban climate change, which is real, which is a problem, which leads to bigger heat waves in the city where people live, but it's not representative of 98% of the planet. Um, so uh, we, in our, our analysis, we re predominantly rely on what's called NOAA's Global Historical Climatology Network, GHCN. And for up until version three, which was discontinued in 2019, they're now onto version four, but up until version three, they were including estimates of urban, how urbanized each station were. They had two estimates with three different rankings. So we were able to use that to sort urban and rural. After now the latest version, they've dropped any estimates of urbanization which they, they, they seem to say, oh, nobody cares about how urbanized the station is anymore. So we've been trying to work on that ourselves, but it's a lot of work um, because we're one of the only groups that actually seems to care about this problem. Um, if you look, uh, we also, we try to be specific when we're well, limited to provide the caveats of our analysis. If you look at the temperature data that is available in this map on the bottom left-hand side, you can see that in 1880, almost all of the stations were in three regions, North America, Europe, East Asia. We think it would be cheeky to call it a global analysis, especially when you look at how few of these stations are rural. So we said, look, we can find rural stations. So We've, I've labeled here with the green circles are rural and the red squares, urban, and the yellow triangles, semi-urban. So you probably, there's uh, not as many rural stations. There's lots in, in more recent years. So it's actually ironic, counterintuitive. The urban heat island problem is a bigger problem for the earlier part of the record. It's not so big for the most recent period. Even though urbanization is getting bigger, there's a lot more rural data now. There is very little rural data for the older periods. So if we look at this, and it's, it's not just the urban rural. Like, so these are, these are stations I've personally visited. I just threw up a couple of them, just so people get an idea of what a weather station is. This, I can, do you see this white box in the center here? This is called a Stevenson screen. Uh, it was actually invented by the father of Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Treasure Island. And it's widely used up to now. And this is what most of the data is based on, is this, the temper, the thermometer is put in this box. And the box is to try and protect it from some of the surrounding. Well, what happens if you, uh, you're keeping your records every day for 15 years, and then the weather station owners say, guys, we have to move our weather station because uh, we have to sell the land or we have to move it, or there's a new building coming in. If you have the weather station moves uh, uphill or downhill, the temperature it's going to be recording will change in the record. But it hasn't actually been a real climatic change. It's a non-climatic change. Also, if you change the thermometer, 
the instruments, if you have buildings coming up around, if you have trees being growing or being cut down. So there's a lot of different things. How do you correct for these non-climatic biases? Well, when we started looking at this, we said, well, the best place is to, first of all, find out what changes have occurred. So uh, Michael and I, we went down to uh, Valencia Observatory. It's one of the longest rural records available today. It's in Ireland. And so we were able to drive down, talk to the to the owners and find out exactly what happened. So I don't know if you can see in the... the they told us there's been four noteworthy major events that were noteworthy. So the first is that it used to be on an island offshore. And then in 1892, they moved it to on land and they kept it there until 2001 when they moved it up a few, inland a few hundred meters. And, but tank, and then in 2012, they changed from auto, ma manual to automatic. Well, fortunately, for the last two changes, they actually had kept parallel measurements for two years before discontinuing the old ones. And they gave us that data and we were able to analyze it. And so what we did is we didn't have the data for 1890 because they weren't, they didn't think about it back then. Uh, 1937 was when the Republic of Ireland was founded. And so it used to be Brit we used to be part of the British Empire and then we became independent. So technically this went from being change of government, but it, the, the staff told us there was no changes in instrumentation or observation, it just continued and just changed the, the administration. But we found that 2001 move actually made temperatures cooler by 0 0.3 degrees Celsius. What's that, by 0 0.5 degrees Fahrenheit, so something like that. And what we realized is you have to actually correct for that because you're now recording something that's 0 0.3 degrees colder. So you had to add in some warming for the next bit. The 2012, there was no change. So I don't know, does that seem reasonable approach to getting a more climatically representative record for this long rural record? Um, what do other groups do? Not, they don't do that. So mm. most of the groups, what they're relying on, they don't really care about the station history metadata, this information about the stations. They actually, they decided in the 90s, they started developing these automated computer programs that are called, they use statistical homogenization algorithms to try and correct for apparent uh, non-climatic biases. So what they do is they take each temperature record and then they identify the nearest stations to it. And then they look at the station records for the neighbors and they compare the difference between them. And then what they find is, oh, suddenly there's a 0 0.3 degree warmer or cooler relative to the other. And then they say, oh, let's apply an adjustment to their temperature record to bring it in line with the trends of the, the neighbors. And that's what they do. And they, uh, Noah, aside from the US component, Noah didn't bother collecting station history metadata, which was very frustrating. They said it was too much work uh, to do it, which, yeah, it was a lot of work. We could occur, uh, concur, but it was important work. Um, so how well does their this algorithm work? It, so they've tested this algorithm using computer simulated data, and it works very well on synthetic data. Um, and so the techniques have been well tested on a theoretical basis, but how do they do with real data? So let's go back to this Valencia Observatory. Um, and so you recall, here's the adjustments we apply in the bottom panel. We say, Nothing. There might be something there, but we couldn't see any difference before and after. This was not a thing. We find there is a non-climatic adjustment. So these red dashed lines, vertical dashed lines, are documented events. And the black dashed line is the adjustments that we applied to the raw data to correct for the non-climatic biases. So how did NOAA's adjustments fare? When we looked at this, we were completely shocked. We spent ages looking at saying, what is going on with this? 
this is like crazy. So the first thing to notice is when we looked and he said, they're planning a load of adjustments, but none of them were based related to the actual documented events. You can see those, those this, red this lines. Here. The you red lines are the documents. And then you, you see the big jumps up, up and down, you know, and then we're like, okay. But then uh, when we, this was, we were collaborating, we decided, oh, let's but, all but date other, this because sorry, we, that we were looking at The other at, thing is, but they never detect the real temperature. Yeah, they don't detect the, the actual documented events with this magical uh, computer program that they had for Valencia Observatory, at least. They didn't detect the actual events. All of the adjustments they were doing were for separate events that they made up. And then here was the other bizarre thing. We downloaded the thing in 2011. And, and we didn't want to... Yeah. yeah, we wanted to update the analysis, said we better, we want to look up to 2015. So then we downloaded the latest version. And then we realized the adjustments had changed, completely changed. So these non-climatic adjustments, they scrapped the old ones and they replaced them with, with new ones. Yeah, and and they they know better, yeah. Nonsense. Yeah, so we went back through time, we downloaded a few different versions of the data set. And then we found every, we had five different versions. Everyone, they were applying completely different adjustments to the same weather station to this. And none of them matched up with the documented events for this particular station. Of course, there are 7,000 stations in this temperature record, but you can see we're already concerned. Well, I, we, I, I, we we started collaborating with another guy, Peter O'Neill. You yeah, O'Neill. Independently from us, he had also found this. And he, he he had been saying, this is very bizarre. So he started downloading the <laughs> from Noah's website, the before and after. Okay. He, Just as a byproduct, uh, he was downloading all this data. At one stage, they lost their data. Oh, and they asked him if he could get it back. Well, yeah, this was with NASA. <laughs> yeah, he's with also, yeah, with the GIS group. Yeah. He Hello, Gavin. Right, at one point, they, they wanted, could you share some of the data? Because we know you've been downloading it and we've lost an old copy. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah. But he's been downloading this every, initially every month or so. Then he started every week. And then he realized, the adjustments are being rerun every day. And he said, I got to download it every day. So every said, day. Every yeah. day you download it. So we, he now has like uh, nearly 2,000 versions of GHCN version 3 going back to 2010. Uh, and what we said, well, let's see how the adjustments have changed over time. And then we said, but again, how do these compare with reality? But well, this is the problem. We had the data for that. And let's explain this result. Yeah. yeah. So what we did is in 2021 to 2022, we went, we reached out to groups in Europe, across Europe, looking at the different met, met, uh, met societies or climate groups in the different countries in Austria, in Slovakia, all over, around the, Europe and say, can you provide us with the station history metadata for as many stations as you can. And they've been doing it locally. And so what we did is we did this collaboration with them. So the four of us, the first four authors and the rest of them, they each contributed the station history metadata. And then we said, let's compare how they match. So we got more than 800 stations, the stations colored in red, the white, we still don't have data for, but we might be able to get some more of that. Uh, but we were trying to get it done with 800, we reckoned we'd enough. And we said, okay, first of all, for those 800 stations, how are the adjustments in Peter's 2000 data sets? Uh, he found, uh, we found only 17% of the adjustments that Noah applies to a given station record are repeatedly applied to that every Consistent time. Consistent over time, yeah over time, over the 10 year period, they just, they said that, so they're real, they're probably real. But then we said, but the others are changed. You download, download, you download the data set on Tuesday and these are the adjustments. Then you download it on Wednesday and they're different adjustments. That's what we're talking about by inconsistent. The same data set and, and 
almost nobody seems to know this. It was, the people are if you were, this data. If you were to do an analysis on on the data that you downloaded from that from, from Noah, Noah, and then published a paper on it. The next day, you'd have to correct your paper and republish it. it yeah, it's, yeah. It's, if, if people knew this, they don't notice. And it's like, so Dennis, how do these compare with actual documented events that we've gotten? And less than 20% of the adjustments matched up. And I want to put in the caveat, you know, because there, there definitely are undocumented events that are non-climatic. But we would be expecting at least 50, 50 or, you know, even 80, 20. It's like less than 20% of them actually correspond with a documented event. And then when you realize that Noah doesn't even agree on it because no, they, no, 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 on Tuesday no. disagrees with the adjustments on Wednesday. So yeah. this is, this is like, and this is one of the most widely used data sets by and and uh, people don't, don't know what they're doing with this. And now that's one problem with Noah's GHCM homogenization. Um, the but we realize there's another problem. This is and this is not just with Noah. This is for all of the current statistical homogenization programs. It's a statistical artifact that people. Some people had documented. Even uh, Professor De Gentano in 2006, pro Professor Pelke Sr. in 2007 had said there's a problem here, but it's just largely ignored. Uh, we started to look at it. It's called the urban blending problem. The, do you remember I was saying when they are identifying a non-climatic bias and then they say, oh, it's cooler or warmer and they apply an adjustment. How do they calculate that adjustment? They look at the neighbor station before and after that break point, it's called the, the time of the thing. And they compare it for five years, 10 years before and after, and they calculate the difference. And that seems fine. It works well with all the computer, the synthetic simulation. But if your urban neighbor is becoming urbanized, then some of that difference is going to be urban warming. So you have your rural station, and actually rural stations, because they're less well kept, they have a lot more breakpoints, ironically. And so they're applying an adjustment. They say, oh, there's a big jump here. And then they say, we correct it. But what they end up doing is they're correcting it to match yeah. the trends of the urban neighbors. So what you end up is that after homogenization, yes, you get rid of all the big jumps. have a demonstration right here. Oh, you have some, some, some. <laughs> My wife prepared the fruit. Yeah. You get a homogenous smoothie, a nice blending, blended smoothie, a mix of all of the fruits. It can be delicious. But if it's not pure strawberries, if you put in your banana. So what's happening is all of the trends, they are homogenous afterwards, rural and urban. They all show about the same trend because the urban biases have become mixed between all of the different But stages. another side effect is that the actual data is smoother as well. Yeah, it's smoother. So, so this is a big problem that has just been overlooked. And um, now we're going to talk about uh, what we have done up to, to try and resolve this up to present. And we have analyzed it and Michael will show the results. We'll discuss the results first for what we have tried to do up to now. But now that we have these two new papers, so this is an analysis we did in 2021, but now that we have these new papers confirming the things, we now are in a position to do a more robust going forward. But already the results we have, we think are more reliable than what the IPCC is an analyzing for the land component. So just to give you a heads up on what we're doing, we remember I said the GHCN version 4 doesn't have any urban ratings. Well, working with Peter, we've been able to come up with ratings for stations, and we've tested it on three different countries, uh, China, Japan, and the US, with our papers that we've mentioned there. Uh, we've also, as I mentioned, we have station history metadata for 800 European stations, and we're working with other people to they realize there's a big problem now. So we are hoping, at least for Europe, we also have the data for the US. We're reckoning we can do more 
evidence-based adjustments moving forward. And we also know, no this homogenization that a lot of people have been relying on doesn't work. It's unreliable. Uh, all of the current methods are contaminate, are leading to urban blending. So we have, there are workarounds to try and reduce that. So we plan to do that in going forward. But in the meantime, this is our best estimate so far. And we published this in uh, an early version in 2015, and then in a much improved version where we took on board feedback from community and also from a number of colleagues. We've done an even better version in 2021. And this is, what we did is we went and we looked in version three of the data set and said, where are the longest and best kept, the longest and most complete rural records? And let's find the regions that have most of it. And regions where we had some not, uh, information about non-climatic biases and station history methods that where we could try and correct for some of the non-climatic biases at least. Uh, what we found is there's a, we could only we were for, we've only we'd only we identified four regions. We did had a good data for that, but we found they're all northern hemisphere. But they actually represent 90% of the rural data going back to the 19th century. You saw that graph yeah. in the field earlier. There are no stations yeah. in the in the southern So we, we, we said this to Northern no, Hemisphere, and then people were saying, your results aren't about global. They don't include the Southern Hemisphere. Yes. Yeah, because we didn't have the data. Nor so, did they. Nor did they. But well, they have data that has urban data, and they should put that in. Um, the other point to notice is look at the areas are each geographic, they're each sampling different parts of the Northern Hemisphere, and uh, they're geographically isolated from each other. So we have four different samples of Northern, from Northern Hemisphere, and we're covering from the tropics to the poles. So we think that this is quite uh, climatically representative of the Northern Hemisphere land component for the rural data. Uh, and uh, Tom, I think you'll be, have the slides available. Uh, is that correct? Yes. So if you want to read through, you can look and see the details on this. Also read our papers for the deep dive into it. But um, here are the corrections we do for Ireland, the US. Uh, I mentioned something about China. There is no rural data for China going back to the 19th century. But there are urban stations. But what we said is, well, look, we, we can use the rural data when we have it. And then we can also do urbanization corrections to the records during the we, period overlap. And then we can use those urban corrected earth stations to go back to the 1840s. It's not perfect, but it's a, a way to at least estimate rural China back to the days. And this region, rural Arctic, that's actually our weakest. Uh, we had been reaching out to uh, researchers in the Arctic station, say, can you give us any information on, on climatic biases? And everyone was drawn a blank. It's only in the 2022 paper that we finally are starting to get people saying, that this is an important problem. So for the Arctic, we just said, get rid of all of the urban stations. And it, it, what you'll see is of the four estimates, this is the one that shows the most warming. And so we don't know how climatic this extra warming is, but that's what you've got. This is it. These are the caveats. But how does this average of all of these together? Uh, the top graph on the right is the standard Northern Hemisphere land components using all stations, urban and rural. The bottom is our estimate. And you can see, I want you to see, there are the timings of these ups and downs. So the, these are, have been smoothed over an 11 years smoothing. Yes. yes, yes for yes. clarity, to try and make it a little bit easier to see the overall trends. The, the, all the smoothed data is available to people who are interested in the papers. Uh, I would recommend, and you can download the series as well. We yep. provide all of our data in supplementary material. Right anybody that wants to use this data. Um, so if you look the ups and downs, uh, they're the, we, we're getting the same timings of these ups and downs, but there are two big differences. By the way, can you see my mouse? 
Uh, yes, yes, we can. Yeah, okay, that's good. So if you were to draw a straight line through here, yeah. this is a linear trend. If you were to draw a straight line through the urban that urban and rural, you'd get about 0.4 degrees or 0.9 degrees Celsius per century. Um, what's that in Fahrenheit? One point eight times point nine. Yeah. Anyway, one point six. One point six. Anyway, in Celsius, we're European. Sorry about that. Uh, if you if you were to draw a straight line through the rural only, you'd only get point six degrees Celsius per. And so already we know there's forty to fifty percent of the warming is urban. And the IPCC insists that it's less than 10%, and so therefore doesn't need to be bothered about Yes, they don't have any strong justification for doing that. Either. Yeah, they're referring to a pace. It's a session. It's always like that. Yeah, making yeah. yeah. Now, but the other thing is, so the when you look at this rural, it doesn't look like global warming. It's global warming to the 40s, then global cooling to the 70s, then global warming. We're finding multi-decadal oscillations, almost cyclical. This doesn't match up with CO2, uh, and it could match up with, suggests a more of a natural origin, which Michael and Willie will talk about later on. Yeah, well, the fact that this is the uh, overall thing, and just say, oh, but it's why are you using this data that has all these non-climatic biases and all of these adjustments? Uh, it's like, well, it's because it's a mess. As I mentioned before, sea surface temperatures, they have in the, they're relying on different estimates going different ships passing by at night. Temperature proxies are indirect. Um, and then most of the other estimates you'll hear about actually only began in the 1950s, like the weather balloons, the ocean heat content, or the 70s, the satellite records, or even 2000s. The, so... If you want to look at from 19th century, you can't use them, I'm afraid. Um, and I I know we're going into a lot of details here, I am, but hopefully this is of interest to people. We need this stuff here. Sea surface temperatures. This is These graphs here, these are from uh, John Kennedy and colleagues in 2019. And by the way, I don't think they agree with us. They don't like us our work, but nonetheless, they are, th these papers that they've done, they're good science. They're presenting good results. They're putting the caveats. They're saying, these are things we're concerned about. Um, and then they say it, but global warming is all bad made, of course, because the IPCC said so. But um, if you look at the sea surface temperature data, first, it's mostly the Northern Hemisphere, again. Uh, there's some Southern Hemisphere, but you can see the blue is the Northern Hemisphere. It's the thing. Also, very little data before the 1950s. And then here's the other thing. The types of measurements change. Here's the types of measurements for each year. Yeah. This is World War II. We don't know what these measurements, the bits in gray. But you can see a lot of the measurements are ERI, engine room intake measurements. Uh, and a lot are bucket measurements. And then in the 80s onwards, we have these buoys. Um, but compare the engine room intake and the buckets. What uh, Kennedy and colleagues did, they say, well, they said, let's, for the exact same regions and times, like and like, they found that the engine room intakes showed a slight cooling from the 40s to 70s, which is consistent with the rural data, but the buckets showed a warming over that same yep. period. And that's more consistent with the urban data, which is correct. Well, they just averaged it together. And yep. Yeah, now we're not happy with that. But anyway, temperature proxies, just Michael mentioned about the, the un, unprecedented, they used the pages 2K to compare, you know, they got a kind of a like mixing together the two. They said, oh, you don't get this warming. This is the pages 2K data the proxies, almost all Northern Hemisphere, mostly tree rings. Um, but here's the other thing. If you sort the, they averaged them all together to get this unprecedented. But if you look at, say, the lake sediments versus the marine sediments, you get completely different temperature reconstructions. Marine sediments, it was hotter than present for a thousand years. Uh, and then the 
the glaciers show this other, the tree rings, they just average it all together, but there's a lot of nuances there. So we think it's important to not just mix everything together, but to compare like with like. So we'll do that here. Here are the tree ring proxies for the Northern Hemisphere. Here are the glacier land proxies for the Northern Hemisphere. Here is our rural only data. And here are the sea surface temperature data. And what we're finding is that actually outside of the urbanized areas to, to represent 2%, we are finding the same behavior, warming, cooling, warming, warming to the 40s and 50s, cooling to the 70s and then warming. And then the weather balloons, uh, they capturing the warming since the 70s, same with the satellite, ocean heat content. So I got to hand you over. I'm, you're probably sick of me at this point. So I'll hand you over. Oh, my friend. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Michael and uh, Ronan, for making this uh, introduction so clear. Indeed, we have found problem in terms of how you identify global warming. So we think that the instrumental data are problematic and best <laughs> and worse. <laughs> and now I want to talk about the causal issue, the attribution process. Michael has already explained that IPCC uses this hindcast, computer climate model hindcast, right, to try to plug in you know, your climate drivers, right? Natural or man-made, right? And then of course, they, they try to compare apple to apple. They try to put this in terms of uh, scientifically, quote unquote, in terms of something called the relative forcing, which you, we don't entirely endorse. It's in what per meter square so that you can compare them in some whole, some sense. And the Heinkast does compare, use only two natural climatic drivers, solar and volcanic. But then you can imagine that IPCC is very concerned about the human aspect of it. So they have up to 11 climatic drivers of human aspect. And you can see they have CO2, they have methane, they have the laughing gas, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> they got even things like contrails and the black carbon. Later, when you see the how IPCC represented the solar part, you can see that the, the solar is actually very similar to the contrail on black carbon, which is very mysterious why it is so. So we will explain, of course, into the sausage making right here. So in bottom line is that IPCC say that the human part of the climate change can be summed in these 11 components. So Roland, let's show the, the natural part of it first. In terms of the volcano and the, and the solar, let's show the next slide. Well, uh, well, volcanic, you can see that it's on inter-annual time scale. So year to year, it's kind of large in individual years, but then they say, oh, after a year, it just disappeared. So it's a bit of a cartoon, by the way, for, for, for if you think about volcano, how volcano is different, every volcano is different, all kinds of chemistry, water vapor, blah, blah, blah. But for the sun one is the most amazing, actually. It's finished. The whole problem is solved by IPCC without even climate model. Finish. Because it's so small. Okay, next please. Let's compare now the natural part with the anthropogenic. Is there a chance for the solar to be affected? Oh, of course, IPCC is correct. There's nothing more to do. We want to explain to you in this particular section that I get to talk about is that in so. Right. So when in a climate system, there's, there's no chance for the earth itself to even have any energetic to supply for the circulation, the atmospheric circulation, the ocean circulation, even, even of course the photosynthesis for the planets and so on and so forth, the biological aspect of it. You know that the, in terms of energetics, the earth is about 2 billion times weaker. Even if you calculate the, the radiogenic heat, by the way, it's very interesting, the, the upper bound, the estimate was done by Joe Neutrino, measured by the guy Juan uh, Gianluca Alimonti, his paper just got retracted by the way. <laughs> by the reopened journal of physics. Some of you may have heard of this, but it's, it's actually 10,000 times smaller than this. This number, 10 to the 17, is actually only 10 to the four, uh, uh, 15 or so, uh, 14 or 13 or so. And this, this extra 10,000 part is actually come from the converted energy that was given by the sun itself. So next, please. Yes, we want to ask the question, could IBCC have underestimated the role of the sun? If you want to ask me that, could they actually overestimate? No, no, no. They could not possibly overestimate because the sun effect, according to IBC, is zero. You cannot overestimate a zero, right? Isn't it? Next, please. So I want to 
really introduce you a bit about the sun. How do we go about understanding this subject, right? The sun is very dynamic. First of all, it's very large in size, right? And then, but it's, it's, it's not the size that is important, it's energetic, as you can imagine. If you want to think about the sun, the solar diameter is actually, you can put 110 Earth inside. And then if you put in volume 3D, you can put a 1.3 million Earth inside it. So next, please. We want to now study in details about the sun. The most important feature about the sun is the magnetism, right? Sunspot is one of it. It's the oldest observational uh, subject that we have in, for humankind in some sense. The center of the, the black part of the sunspot is actually a very intense magnetic field region up to 10,000 Gauss, right? That's about 10,000 times stronger than the Earth's average magnetic field. And next, please, even in sunspot, you know there are varieties of stuff that we need to worry about. There are small sunspots, there are large sunspots, and then, in fact, not only the, the sunspot itself, there are bright regions called a faculty. The sunspot is called macule, right? And then you even need to worry about very intense magnetic field region called umbra, and then slightly lighter region called penumbra. That's mainly because the magnetic field lines are slanted slightly, right? And my colleague, Douglas Hoyt, which is the premier sunspot historian, really can think that these features are very important and relevant for estimating the sun's irradiance, okay? So next, please. Here, sunspot has been observed, indeed, recorded since Galileo Galilei pointed his telescope 1610 towards the sun. Even the brilliant mind like Kepler, the guy that invented the Kepler orbital dynamics law, really missed this particular point. Kepler was also looking at the sun, but he thought that the sunspot was not there, mainly because of the passing of a planet in front of the sun, So, but he didn't go continue observing. And Galileo had the insight to keep observing over time. So over, now we have accumulated over 410 years or, or so of the sunspot activity record, right? And one of the most crucial features that is very obvious is actually this roughly 11 years light cycle, right? It's not even exactly 11 years. In fact, people make use of the fact that it's not exactly 11, that the changes of the cycle length could be of some interest in terms of understanding how the sun's magnetic activity changes and affect the light output. And then, but the most prominent period is actually what we call the Monda minimum. I actually spent a year of my, my my weekend to actually produce a semi popular book called The Mondo Minimum, by the way, in 2004 when I published that. And this is basically sunspot appeared to disappear during this period. And the question you need to ask is that how, how much the light output has changed compared to, let's say, the modern period, right? And you can see that individual sunspot cycle is also not the same. Sometimes it's higher, like in the 80s, the activity was very high. And the cycle 24, the one that peaked about 2016 or 15 or so, is very weak. Okay, And then now, of course, people are struggling whether it's strong or weak in the next level. But with modern instrumentation, you can actually measure sunspot activity, the magnetic variability, using things like the calcium singly ionized calcium, H and K emission line. And then, as I alluded to, the umbra and penumbra ratio is also important, and then solar cycle length, and then numbers were even consider, let's say, you know, the decay rate of the sunspot, you know, how long the sunspot on average can live. Some sunspot can live very long, some sunspot can live only by days, okay? And then you can also study the solar equator rotation rate and things like that, that, that give you an assessment of how strong or how weak actually each solar activity cycle is. Next, please. As we can see that the sun emits in multicolor. This is one of the examples. You have basically visible light, and then the middle panel here at the top panel is just a magnetic flux, right? And then here we're studying the sun rotating, the sunspot rotating across, and show you how the, the, the output is being adjusted. When the sun passes in the center, the magnetic flux increases, but the light output decreases. In, this is invisible wavelength. And then you have the UV, EUV at the bottom, and then X-ray. X-ray, you can see that one blip there is about 30% changes. But the question that we really want to know is that if you integrate over all the wavelength, okay, so that's called total solar irradiance, that you want to know how much does it change so that you can actually study in terms of apply to the climate model, for example. And here, this is the best effort by all solar physicists. It started in late 1970, 78. So about November or so, we put out the first satellite called number seven. And then you can see now, each satellite can only last 10 to 15 years. That's the problem in, in terms of the solar physics here, the sign, is that we cannot sustain the measurements for a very long time, let's say for 100 years, for example. 
But and here you can see it goes up and now it does have the solar cycle kind of indication. But the problem is that how does each solar cycle differ from each other? That's what we want to know, really. So the next thing that I want to highlight is indeed this kind of problem. How do you calibrate the different satellite measurement? The actual level, as you can see, ranges from 1360 to 1372. So that's a huge change, 12 watt per meter square. Something that really we need to know how to put it together. It is a problem of solar physics. But to say that the problem is solved, like IPCC is assuming, it's just ridiculous in some sense. It's just crazy, actually, wrong to say that. Next, please. First problem I want to point out is that, as we know, there's an, a set of measurement that is very well known by the NASA GPL group, led by my colleague, Sir Richard Wilson. Uh, it's called ACRIM. So he put this satellite measurement up from about, I think, starting about 1979 or so, his first measurement. And then it, it, it really died down, 1989. The, the instrument failed, by the way. So then they want to put up the second satellite. They already prepared for that. But the problem is that in the, in the intervening period, U.S. Uh, Space Shuttle Challenger tragedy, right? 1986, that prevented launching of any space platform for many years. Okay, so now you have a problem. <laughs> How do you calibrate the Akrim data sets? You can see the Nimbus one indicate between the, the gap period, which is from about 89 to about 91, is showing high kind of increasing trend. And then there's another satellite available at that time was Erbis, and this is a NOAA satellite that's showing the decreasing trend during the, the peak period. So and indeed you caused this problem. Which one is correct? We don't know actually. That's the that's an honest scientific way to say this, rather than to say that, oh, we know it all, we can fix sunspot cycle to this, and then therefore we know this result. No way. And therefore, there's another rival component called the PMOD by the Switzerland group. So we will show the, the result next. By the way, next please. The PMOD is actually done by the, the, the SOHO, the Virgo instrument, okay? By, headed by Klaus Froelich from Switzerland, the late Klaus, uh, Klaus Froelich, he just died. And here you can see, even when we have similar time measurements, you know, kind of overlapping from 2003 to 2020 compared to the source, which is the University of Colorado group, you have problem. Because in the beginning of the period from 2003 to 2008 or so, you can see source slightly over underestimate SOHO. And then when during the peak 2013 to 2015, 16 or so, you can see it slightly overestimate that. So we do have indeed a calibration problem in solar physics. So how do you make the solar composite, you know, for 40 years or so? Because we have data from 79 to about 2022 or current time, right? So next, please. We want to show you the consequence of this problem now. Here's a, here's a way to try to show the problem. PMOD and uh, ROB is what you call the Royal Observatory of Belgium. So that's another independent group. Okay. Then you can see that their DSI composite over 40 years or so somewhat fit what you call the sunspot number record activity. That is actually a very, very remarkable result. If you really know anything about sunspot number, it's just basically counting sunspot, the number of sunspot during the sun. It's telling you that when the sunspot number is zero, is zero. There's nothing lower than that. But here they're saying that the minimum from 86 to 96 to 2008 or so are all the same. I mean, knowing how dynamic the magnetism on the sun is, I doubt that this result is truly valid in some sense. And then this is why when Akrim pointed this difference between the minima, you know, you can see the next minima go down, the next, you know, 896 was high and then low and then low again. So that leads to a lot of uh, people say, oh, they must be wrong. Maybe it's just, no, 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 no. The Akrim uh, measurements are very careful, very nicely controlled and they check everything. And this seems to be a realistic result, but then they try to say that, oh, it could be wrong and we cannot trust the cream and then PMOD and the and Royal Observatory of Belgium should be trusted. But now I want to point to the consequence of using ACRIM, PMOD, or, 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 or ROB, which is a Belgium group, in terms of calibrating the estimate the TSI composite back, TSI variability back to, let's say, 17th, uh, 16th, or 18th century or so, right? Here, we let's start with uh, RMIB and PMOD. You can see now, going back, this is actually no change, you know, except for the amplitude. There's modulation from the amplitude, but the minimum is all the same values according to RMIB, and it fit the sunspot number record. Again, I kind of doubt the physical reality of this result, by the way, but that's what it is, given us what it is. And then you can see the one that recommended by 
uh, IPCC AR6 is actually a paper that is published by Katia Mattis et al. In published in 2017, they use slightly one or two additional proxy just rather than sunspot number alone so that they can fit the, what you call the minimal changes a little bit, okay, a little bit better than the also be. Then you can see the ultimate one is essentially the acrine calibrated result. There are five solar activity proxy being used here. Clearly that this is a very different picture, isn't it? But then the question is that can we rule this out one way or another? We have approached this topic very, very objectively, very, very following the science. And then we really wanted to understand which one is correct. So next, please. So we will try to show you our ultimate result. A paper, by the way, by chance, finally appeared online today in the research in astronomy and astrophysics, led by Roland. We compiled 27 PSI estimates. By the way, in our 2021 paper, we have 16. Now we added nine more in just two years. And then if you remember what we just said about I, uh, uh, what you call the IPCC, in AR7, they recommend us. AR4. AR4, yeah, 2007, AR4. <clears throat> they recommend us 60 years later to use. And then 2013, AR5, which I already jumped ahead of my gun, is that, Rona, maybe we go next. They recommended four of this. And then in year 6 2021, they get even more confident. They say you should use only one. And then we go from 2021, 20, 16 to 27, because it's truly more uncertain. That is the honest answer. Oh, and then IPCC obviously is running the other direction. Obviously, they don't want to see us, they don't want to talk to us, and so on and so forth. But it's not because they are ugly, by the way, right? So I dress up today for this purpose to try to make sure that you understand that we are all about science, nothing but the science. But the bottom line in our 27 TFI estimate is that we have eight acrim uh, calibrated results, 15 PMOD results, one so-called climate commun the community composite, and then three what you call purely SSS estimate, which means they say that to measure total solar irradiance, please don't put satellite up because it's a waste of time. All you need to do is measure sunspot number. Remember, sunspot number is just looking at the sun's image every day, count the number of sunspots, the small spot and then the big spot, you weight it differently, but that's all you need to do. That's kind of a bit strange, by the way. That's not physics. That's just numerology. And it's a very, very sad that sometimes, you know, science turn into such a problem that people are not willing to discuss this openly. We are always willing to discuss this topic. So finally, the last slide I want to emphasize is that indeed, as of today, September 27, 2023, we would recommend that there is eight of these acrine calibrated results available. And one ought to really study this. I would recommend IPCC study this. And then that before we do that, we just say, sorry, IPCC, since you refuse to do this, we will do our own homework. So independently from you, because science is about being independent, okay? And Michael now going to take over and discuss the results that we have produced based on our two recent papers. Okay. So in August, the Journal of Climate published a paper which we co-authored with 34 other researchers from 18 different countries. In this paper, we, we did a case study in which we uh, took the rural and urban temperature time series that was used in AR6 and the Matthias uh, TSI one. So you can see the yellow line there is the Matthias Mat Mattis. Uh, the Mattis, Mattis, yeah. uh, uh, solar output they use. And the red line is the temperature combining the solar, the rural and urban. And then in the slide underneath, and it's, it's, there, it, it's an old match. It's, yeah, yes, but, yes. Yeah. There's no way. Yes. They have worked. Well, slide underneath, we've taken the Hoyt and Schaff, uh Akram output, and we've compared that with our rural temperature series. So if you were looking at the first slide there, you would say, right, uh, it's all man-made. Uh, but if you're looking at the second slide there, you'd say it's all uh, natural. But... The, the the paper that Willie has just uh, or at least mostly not natural. Natural. Yeah. yeah. If you uh, if you go to the next slide, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this paper that was just appeared being published online today. Um, what we have done there is uh, we've analyzed all of the twenty seven published TSI series 
and compared them with five published uh, 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 chapter numbers. So uh, we did the analysis of all of them. Is it the five that I mentioned earlier? Right. Yeah. We expand that. That we can we can expand yeah. that one there. So basically, the middle of the slide there shows how much you would do if you were just using the IPCC's anthropogenic forcing, right? 92%. 92%. But, but uh, that, if you look at uh, the solar forcings, the first uh, ones there show uh, 94, 96, 90 day. They can explain all the temperatures. To they, this surface. can even explain more than the anthropogenic, yeah. this one. And this is about the same. But if you go to the other end, and if you go yeah. to the one that the IPC does, that I'll, doesn't explain that. Yeah, well. yeah. Here's the Mathis 2017. Yeah. is only 13% of the warming, so most right. can explain. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, I, if we go to the next slide, Ron. Yeah. Uh, so... In the paper, we have all of these graphs. There are loads of them supple supplementary information. You can go and look at all of it. It's all available for anybody to reanalyze themselves. Right. But what we have done here is just taken the five different temperature records, right? And then we have just done three of the solar outputs. And then the red line that you can see, it's actually, like, yeah, that red line, that's the, uh, the IPCC's human caused forcing. So no natural, no natural ones. Forces. You can see the human caused one uh, can't explain the earlier rural temperature records. Uh, whereas you can see three of the solar outputs are quite a good explanation for it. So them. I just point out that it's the black line with the gray error bars is, is, is the temperature records and the red fit is that's that's using uh, no, that's, that's no the, natural factors, just yeah. anthropogenics. Right. Yeah. Not on smooth. That's, that's killing point. point. The, the yeah. really did it. And the blue ones are showing the solar fits, what the hindcasts, if you will. Okay, so can we go yes. on this? Or... Yeah. Uh, this is comparing the uh, same solar and the natural forces with the sea surface temperatures. Again, you can see that the uh, the IPCC uh, human caused one explains the later one, but it does a terrible job of explaining the earlier stage. Yeah, if so there is that warming, cooling, warming. Exactly. Uh, so again, if we go just to the one, there's three rings. Again, you see the same phenomenon. So the I, I can I just just yeah. interrupt because it's like we were quite shocked just how remarkable these fits were. We weren't, you know, the, the, the tree ring proxies, we, you know, they're indirect measurements, but it's like the, these fits completely independently, they match almost exactly with the things. Can, can you add something to say about, especially this controversial that they really think that we are idiot. They basically insist that we are so drawn and, and I don't know, accuse me or I don't know, like, you know, it's hanging out too much with Douglas Hoyt, for example. Oh, we don't promote any result over one another. Oh, yeah, please, yeah. So, yeah, please mention that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Michael was showing the results. We did the he did, we did the comparison. We just looked at compared one with another. So we used a Hoyt and shot, which was one of the six that the IPCC used to use. Uh, yeah, I don't oh, yeah, they used to use that in in the uh, ER seven, yeah, ER four, yeah. two thousand seven. Uh, so what's the next but but I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. So basically, what well, we can conclude is that uh, if you look at the IPCC's claim that the urbanization bias is ten percent, less than ten percent, yeah, that's wrong. It's just plain wrong. And then if you say if you look at their claim that uh, uh, you need only use one of the solar outputs that are available in the literature. That's wrong. It's rubbish. You've got to look at all of them. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when we consider the, the non-urbanization data, we can explain uh, most of the warming and cooling since the, uh, in, in terms of solar. We're, solar we're, if we're interested in climate change, you know, we're trying to explain all of the climate change since the mid 19th century. And that includes when it's warming, when it's cooling, when it's warming. The IPCC can't explain 
and it's an all they can do. They their control knobs, the 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 smoking guns that Willie was describing, they just can get. They can only explain warming. They're really very um, not very good, and only recent warming. <laughs> I was born in the first half of the last century. So I remember the 70s very well. In fact, I was a science teacher back then, and our big worry at the time was global cluing. We were afraid of an ice age. In fact, I got so worried about that I helped set up the Irish Solar Energy Society back in 1974, I think it was, 75. So I have seen in my own lifetime the the rising of the temperature, the falling of the temperature, the rising of the temperature again. And I was quite old when they uh, came up with the IPCC uh, ideas 35 years ago. And I, I told, wait a minute, this is a good idea. Maybe we'll get some good results from it. We, we, I, we I have an attempt to try to summarize this, this graph and yeah. what you've been doing all these years. Yeah. Um, is basically the IPCC is interested in basically answers that cannot be questioned. We are more interested in questions that cannot be answered. That is the distinction. I mean, these people are a bit crazy in some sense. They try to say that the urbanization problem is less than actually it, 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 it just it's just the maximum you can push it to the extreme is 10%. In fact, they say it's much smaller, of course. So therefore, don't look at it. Finish. It's three months at a row. Gone, gone, gone. Uh, she has read. The whole problem has been solved. Since Finish. when? Who say who? I have no idea where this comes from, by the way. we be, I've been studying this TSI estimate problem, I would say, oh, since 1991, my friend. I mean, it's been a long time. I mean, sorry that the progress is a bit slow. But least I would blame it on IPCC type of science, or, or even the last well, kids don't. Well, no, uh, the IPCC have got to admit they they have, they they have to. No, they have fulfilled their mandate. They were yeah. set to provide the science that would help promote the right. climate agendas. And the science, that. scientific the information that policymakers could use they're, they're for climate interested. policy. They're not interested in scientific information that will prevent them implementing their policy. Right, right. So, so they uh, have fulfilled their mandate. I, I want to add in another thing because those two papers that we just talked about, and, and even the 2021 one, uh, the, the, the one in climate, we had 30, there were set 37 co authors. Yeah. Everyone in, a, in the group have different views on the relative factors because that's good science. We are, the IPCC is very much, particularly since the third assessment report, they're obsessed with scientific consensus. But it's like, it, it's, it's, it's kind of bizarre that it's like, they, on the one hand, they say, oh yeah, the science is settled. We not, have it all worked out. But then they, they also know they're not saying, yeah, we're finished. We'll hand it over to you. They're still looking for grants. Yeah, yeah. they're still looking for know, more they research. Still want more money you know, all sorts. We, the, the reality oh, is... Speaking of that, Ronan, go to the next slide. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we might as well put the slide out, make sure that uh, some people can yeah. afford this. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, in this kind of independent, fearless science, I mean, we are really not afraid of IPCC, except for, I would say, I am afraid of uh, God, Jesus Christ, but... <laughs> I'm not afraid of IPCC, Gavin Spain, Michael Mann. Bring it on, guys. You know, that's about it. The point is that it is really hard. They control the whole funding aspect. They control who gets to publish. They control what type of science they have to publish. You really have to fit the narrative. I mentioned Ali Monti. It's very sad. The guy is a serious physicist trying to estimate your neutrino measurements from the inside of the Earth so that you can understand radio or radiogenic heat of the planet. I mean, he has certain qualification. He understands things. So when he look at the statistical data of extreme weather, he just publish his view. And he published in the paper. And then if you disagree with him, by the way, it's sad that they just retract the paper. They refuse to send in even a proper counter argument. Okay, let, you know, that's the way it should be done. And they're not doing any such thing. That's why independent science. And the new oh, way of funding science is very, very important in my humble opinion. And we are doing a serious experiment here. With Ronan and Michael and myself, we really try very hard to be not afraid of anything. Just do the best science we can, no complaint. 
But that's why even the problem with thermometer that has not been touched, which is their job, by the way. Hello, Gavin, Noah, and a bunch of these people. And uh, yes. even UK and all group, CRU, for example, Phil Jones group. I mean, they are supposed to produce yes. the result that is reliable, sure. but it's not all reliable. Thought, all that I just wanted to say is we uh, had to go through very rigorous peer review processes to get any of our papers published. We get much more of that. I have published, and so has Ronan and Willie, published lots of papers prior to these yes. climate papers. Yes. And the peer review process was a lot easier than what we we're finding. <laughs> yeah, of course. But then, what I'm looking at is that paper that was published in August in Climate, where, bear in mind that, that we had to go through a rigorous peer review process as well, but we had 34 other international experts in climate right, co-authoring with us. Because climate is a multi-dimensional thing. So you yes. need expertise from all sorts of areas. I'm so this thing is like uh, majorly yes. that paper was published. You had Gavin Schmidt and Michael Mann and those in their real kind of club trying putting out disinformation and 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 trying to have the paper withdrawn. They they sent out uh, 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 like, yeah, anyway, anyway, yeah, okay. it's there. Who, they, who is trying to hide anything exactly? Yeah, no, no, the thing is, if science, during, as, as Willie said, you know, I, we would rather have questions that cannot be answered than answers that cannot be questioned. Question. And apparently, you see, the IPCC is obsessed with this idea of scientific consensus. They try to form consensus well, opinion. Yeah, but they have to do that role. Yeah, it's their, their obligation. Yeah, for their if you come along to politicians and say, some people say that, some people say that, then the politician doesn't know what to do. So they can only present a clear line of attack. Yes, for the yes. So what we so are doing, what we are doing is we are doing following science as opposed to the science. Yeah. And, um, right. Whereas a lot of groups are following politics yes. and they're looking and they say, what is the politically correct result we want to get that everybody agrees? And then how can we make sure our science fits in with that? And then look, even if the politically correct perspective happened to start off being correct, as soon as you stop following science and you start following politics, you're deviating from science. And then when you're finding that this is the bizarre thing, it's like you probably, your listeners, your viewers have probably experienced, if they have asked a question, <laughs> that they reasonable, just ask them an honest question. Hey, like maybe on Twitter or X or in Facebook, or just in, in, to somebody that just said, hey, how do you calculate that? Uh, did, you, did you correct for that? Isn't it interesting? You probably found that you get bullied. You get mocked for asking a question. When we were teaching, from teaching experience, I was always told, I think you were the same, that it's like, there is no such thing. When you're teaching and your students ask, but there is no such thing as a stupid question. Yeah. yeah. You know, because, you know, there's a, there's a saying, you, you know, old yeah. saying, the old He's saying, uh, if you... Ask a silly question and feel silly for a minute. Don't ask a silly question and be silly for life. For life. You know, you people that actually care about science and science communication, they actually want to answer to to try and address the issues rather than bullying people, making them feel small. But, for for asking a question on such a complex issue. When I when I was trying to teach my students way back in the day and that sort of thing, um, I would say, as a scientist, if you put forward a hypothesis of what's going on, you know more about that than anyone else. So it's up to you to try and destroy your own hypothesis. And I find, you know, that I learn more from my mistakes than I do from when I get it right. I actually enjoy finding out that I was wrong because that gives me a whole new So, life. ladies and gentlemen, you are looking like truly fine scientists. I'm, I'm really honored and proud, I have to say, that it's, it's a blessing from God that I met these two guys. So, I should start speaking Irish. I will talk about my dharma very soon. 
And then uh, I do want to apologize that I eat some fruits and it's not to disrespect your audience. By the way, talk, we like to talk, but then we want to feed your thing about putting this on a Twitter. Of course, you can cut it off because all this discussion now perhaps is less important and we already covered the main stage in, in, in the time frame that you want it. It's less than an hour, I would say. So that, so that hopefully we can still have a little fun uh, taping this and talking about this. But in any case, I really appreciate what you're doing also. Now, this is a revolutionary act that requires everybody to take a little, chip in a little bit to try to make it work because they are trying to censor us. You are basically the information propagator now, right? You're the guy who <laughs> not afraid of Gavin. Gavin, can you explain? And then he always come with one liner. I, I do want to. I do want Yes, yeah. prepare yeah, the paper. I, I, I do, he just finished wanted... the thing in one, 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 yeah, as yeah, an, yeah. an hour, actually. I just want to interrupt because you see, because there was like a back and forth between yes. uh, Dr. Gavin Schmidt in the NASA Goddard Institute uh, and and our work because he he's in charge of the realclimate.org. And so he was making, we posted, if you go to the Serious Science website, you'll see yes. the thing. So uh, that's, I think that's the reason why I really was mentioning this. But it's like to your <laughs> audience, we're like, who's Calvin? It's like, I, I tend to joke quite around quite a bit. By the way, no, it, is Calvin it, Schmidt, no, yeah. no. director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Tom Nelson's a buddy, right. buddy. By the mm-hmm. way, yeah. in, in 1915, or sorry, 2015, Ronald and I and the Melda were in New York, and we actually decided we would uh, go and visit them. And uh, I have to say that Gavin, although he couldn't meet the senator, yeah, yeah, he was yes. very accommodating. Yeah, and he did, did provide yeah, his yeah. lead scientist. Yeah, oh, right. yeah, we, we had a very good discussion. He enabled it. So, so I mean, we're not. Criticizing, I, I think Gavin as a person. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I want to emphasize. Look, it's there's, there's obviously you have people. This is the point. Different scientists have, oh, are, have different opinions. Opinion, That's yeah. loud. <laughs> That's when you're doing science, you're going to have a different opinion from other scientists because if everybody had the same opinion. So I'm why finished. are you bothered? Exactly. You just need one. Yeah, no more yeah. You just need one sign. Yes, the whole TSI problem is solved already. I mean, according yeah. to them, TSI problem measurement is done in fact. I mean, yeah. I hope they should be realized about the consequence of those kind of statements. That means we're not putting up more satellite measurement. If it's all just simply based on sunspot number, then we just sit on the ground and measure and count sunspot numbers. And that's yeah. it. The problem is done. This is a very serious scientific problem and challenge, by the way. And to yeah. sweep it under the rug, not only that, to try to bully people into forcing everybody and saying that we are the one that don't know what we're talking about. We are the one that will try to cheat and lie. We are the one that will want to benefit from well, being no, paid by false oil company. All okay. this uncalled for kind of nonsense, you know. Stop it once and for all. If you are built up anything, come and discuss. By the uh, way, I, we are uh, not I, criticizing you as a person. We are criticizing you as a as in your position. Why yeah, did you apply in FOIA? Nothing. Like I, you know. We, yeah, we don't go there. Fine. I, yeah. I addressed all these points out of the So Tom, uh, that's a happy question. <laughs> okay, uh, is it a happy question? <laughs> Sorry. You mentioned the paper that's released today. Uh, is there a way yeah. that we can read that online today, or do we have to pay to read that, or? It should be, it's, it, it's supposed to be in open access. So, uh, and same with the, but I, um, I don't know if it's open access. Yes. Is it really? Not yet open access. It's well, there is a one version of it. But, yeah. but our preprint is as close as you can. Our preprint is as close as you can to the real thing, of course. And, and oh. may, you, you may be, it should be open access soon. Uh, so uh, when you're watching this, it might be open access. If you go to the series-science.com website and go to publications, you can find all of our papers there. Uh, we'll also share these slides and you can do it. And um, maybe we can also give a link to, to, the, to maybe just the, the two most recent papers, the one in climate yeah. and in the research and, and in the, astronomy and astrophysics. One thing that I'd like to point out is that we have included all of our data as supplementary information 
We're not hiding anything. All of our data is available for anybody to go through and check and see if they we're, we're trying to encourage more people to start using the data. To be, you could see what we are were moving, trying to move the science forward. We're trying to get more satisfactory we, answers. We aren't so much interested in the political issues, you know. We will follow the science. And if the science means the one political party is wrong, so be it. Yeah. If it's the other one, so be it. You know, that's it. You actually... Yeah, no, I mean, put it this way. Very simple. If the CO2 effect found to be really strong and really evidential and everything, of course we'll say that. There's nothing. There's no joking about this is there. If it's there. Oh, I mean, when, 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 the, the caveat said, like, the, 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 the point is, we had 30 seven scientists on this paper, the, the one. And what we said is because each of them has different views on the, the CO2 role, the climate sensitivity. Right. right. It's in from, oh, it's a big role to it's nothing and, and in between. And the thing is, that's because scientific opinions are you, you're so all opinions. Yeah, we have to. to yeah, so we to need to. to we are presenting the facts, the information. Well, that's why our conclusion was that so far at the moment, we do not think that the uh, scientific community is yet in a position to say whether global warming since the 19th century is man, mostly man. human caused, mostly, mostly natural, or some mixture in between. Each of us have our own personal opinions on that, our scientific opinions, and they're informed scientific opinions. But, so, we, you know, if you were to listen to myself, Roland and Willie, when we're talking, well, yeah, you agree with us. I very you don't much. agree with all of you, but Roland made a very strong and good point. Good point is that in the paper, we frame the paper as to really asking the question, is the thermometer data that they use or we use commonly used good enough, right? To study the question of climate change or global warming. Is the ingredients data they use? Wait till we, we don't have time and energy. Wait till we start thinking about volcano forcing. I, I really felt that the field of volcanology is completely rocked by this sort of a consensus movement. Volcanology is, is really fascinating subject. Yes. These people turn into a cartoon science. I like to say it that way. IPCC turned everything into cartoon. I mean, it's so simplified that it's actually beyond wrong, actually. It's so bad in that sense. So it's not anything real at all. It's just crazy. And the, and yeah, you rob the science of any true nature and essence of studying volcano even. I mean, yeah. volcano, every volcano is different. You know, how much of the output? Nobody ever talk about how much water vapor come out. What kind yeah. of chemical gas come out? Why are we not talking about that? It's always just turned into a particularly, you know, like reflecting sunlight. Yeah. Blah, 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 this and that, as if they understand so well, many things. Well, They're pounding on their chest. It's just really, really, well, I think Michael wants to say, just say something. Uh, what we uh, have been just discussing today is just our our take on the temperature records and on the solar output. We have lots of other interests and we have other publications that we've put out to do with weather balloon data and everything else like that. So what I'm saying is that this is just concentrating on this discussion. On the, 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 the attribution of global warming. That's all that this is about now. There are other fields that we're covering or working on. We out. have papers on the uh, great energy policies, on business as usual projections on the uh, on things about how uh, about CO two about the balloons that and we have a lot of different things. I don't know. Yeah, we have all kinds of work. Bro. We have earthquake. We have we have everything. I think uh, Tom is uh, trying to get blurry. Uh, no, no, I can go on forever. No, yeah, I'm I'm I would be happy if you did go on forever. I, so <laughs> I, I do. Well, have... I can't because I. Well, no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just chats the German. Yeah. Yeah. So some people on my podcast have argued that the sensitive sensitivity to doubled CO2 from here might result in between zero and 0.5 degrees centigrade of warming. You guys have any comments on that? 
We did in our 2015 paper analyze uh, the uh, what the data was saying. As far as we call it experimentally, we came up with a value of 0.44 as an upper bound. As an upper bound. But what I could say is that's just analyzing those. But we have been looking at other stuff with weather balloon data. We've given presentations on that. And what I'm saying is looking at our weather balloon data, and there's lots of it there, we we can't see a carbon dioxide signature. I, I, look, uh, the, it's very important for your viewers uh, to remember that the carbon dioxide is an infrared active gas. That's proven. Tyndall showed that. An Irish man. And he went. was Irish, so <laughs> it must have been right. It must be right. Yeah. And uh, so... So if you actually look at, there are things, the climate models that people are using, the global climate models, they are based on a particular uh, theoretical framework of how the energy is transmitted through the atmosphere in terms of radiative properties. And so it's very dominated by this thing called, car or by the infrared active properties of the trace gases. And so there's assumptions that are built into, into the models. Going back to Guy El Sazer in the 1940s, he did this uh, theoretical prediction of how to explain the temperature variability as we go up into the tropical pause to the stratosphere. Um, he made those, a number of assumptions in that that were those, never checked. Those assumptions were reasonable starving assumptions and they lead to uh, what the models are today, but they were never actually checked. So what I, 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 I said is how could we check these? So we looked at the weather balloon data because first of all, when the weather balloons go up, they go up above the urban heat island effect. They're taking these measurements. And every day from around the world, from over a thousand stations, these weather balloons are set up and they go up to 35 kilometers before they burst. And so there's millions of data points there. And we have analyzed, and in one of our papers, we analyzed 12, 12 and a half million weather yeah, balloons. Yeah, it's more than that. But and, and what we're saying is that the information coming out of that questions all of the assumptions. Yeah, well, let, let, let not say not say all of the assumptions. No, not all of them, obviously. But it shows that you get it. So look, they, there is a difficulty here because a lot of our work, Michael and I have published uh, working papers that we did before we started collaborating with Willie. These are non-peer reviews. These are working papers in which we present the work that we were describing there. Um, and you can find that on our oprj.net on our website there. Um, and in that we describe it. And we're finding there are fundamental flaws in the assumptions that are embedded in the models, which lead that's to this that, climate that, sensitivity. Well, so we're finding that's not our opinions. That's what the data but it, is. Yeah, no, it's so what, when you look at the assumptions the ex it, that were made in the models, and then you try and compare them with actual observations, then you're finding they're not doing it. So, but it's then- for them, the extreme empiricists. I mean, they're really, we are really into data, right? Not data, data, you know, it's real yeah. data people. Because yeah. data has to drive everything. I mean, this is the rule, the golden rule of science. There's a lot of theoretical speculation, angular momentum conservation, this and that, that predict there ought to be some kind of circulation flows and things like that. But yeah. then, please check. Please check these things because sometimes the equation produced <laughs> doesn't fit the reality. I'm sorry. So yeah. the problem is, you know, I'm trying to talk about something fundamental like circulation pattern, right? It's well known. So this is among one of the aspects of the work, which we have published one paper thus far, well, several papers, but one of the main ones is to study the Hadley cell circulation, right? Whether this thing is real or not? I mean, I actually discussed this in the former podcast I had with yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. remind yeah. them to watch that. Well, I, I think, Tom, I, I would, in the one when you interviewed me, I was pointing out there is an important distinguish, distinction between peer reviewed papers and non peer reviewed. And it has nothing to do with science, but it's to do with public uh, discussions because. 
yeah. a lot of people talk about, a lot of people say, is that peer reviewed? Which means, have you submitted it to a journal and two of, of the, you get one or three, one, two or three reviewers who are working in the field and possibly that your work undermines and they say, do we agree with you? Mm -hmm. And if they agree, then you're published and you're peer reviewed, published in a peer reviewed journal. Yep. If they disagree with you, they say, oh, you need to make these changes or whatever. What I'll say is the, um, the, the soccer is a good analogy. If you, uh, we, the peer review system works, it doesn't matter. You have a scientific ideas, you submit it to a journal, but it's, it's, if your work agrees with the approved existing scientific dogma, then your goal is at the top of the hill. Okay. If you disagree, and that's us generally, <laughs> then your goal is at the bottom of the hill. And the rules are still the same. The ref is the same, everything. Uh, but trying to score a goal up here, you still can. Because we have published peer review papers. But most, all, virtually all of the scientific progress has been made by people who disagree. You know, it, it historically. Historically. But the peer review system, which only began really in the 40s. Well, my, my, one thing I've gone through. Anyway, look. The thing one is, thing I've gone through. The 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 climate we, we, we have, since we formed series there, what, well, it's 25 papers? I, I, yeah. yeah I thought we've had published in the peer review system. So we're not knocking it entirely. We're just saying it's, it's harder to get it through. And what it's we, it's when, not the number, it's the quality of each paper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when, when, we, when we score a goal on that uphill it's thing, like, oh, no, yes. it's, it's, you know that it's been work to do it. I uh, want to say is uh, the work that we publish there, we, av we avoid attributing, we say, we are looking, we're saying, using the methodology that isn't existing, we can replicate the IPCC's findings if we use their data. But what we're pointing out is if you use other data, and other there is scientifically available data, that, that seems to us more realistic, you get the opposite answer. And then you have some of our authors would say, maybe it's in between, maybe it's a bit of both. And, you know, so, so this is the thing. We, the peer reviewed papers that we're saying, say it could be anything from all human cause to all natural. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you can, I, 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 it's not a I, I, I'm making back and you're still talking, but yes. I know my car to be towed away. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Oh, Thank you very much. All right. Um, I, Yes. I just, just have one one final question. Uh, are you looking for more talent or more people to join uh, with you to work on this stuff? Oh yes. Yeah. Well. Well. First of all, all I, as Michael mentioned, all of the data that we have published is, is available. If other people want to work on it and do their own analysis, and we welcome that. Uh, the uh, Willie, if you wanted to to make any more comments on on that, um, uh, yes. But, uh, I, 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 yeah. people, people understand that we really need all kinds. We really are not arrogant in any sense. We want the best of the brightest. <laughs> Sorry yeah. to put that criteria because we we do have actually like uh, through your podcast probably. No, we actually got one guy. And his name is what Adrian. I don't know. If um, but anyway, let's 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 not start. announce his name. But there's yeah. one guy who's working with us now, analyzing the balloon data. We got. He just said, "Can I help? <laughs> Can I help?" I, I mean, he donate a little bit. Uh, donate to our yeah, effort, yeah, and then yeah, just help. Yeah. Yeah. What I, what I what I'd say is um, the series science for there's we are it's a shoestring budget because we're relying on donations. So the first thing is if people donate, the more donations that we get, the more we can expand the team. So we yeah, have yeah. people working with us part time, uh, but it, it, like we would love to, if we had enough funds, if we had, uh, you know, even 1% of the budget that say the NASA Goddard Institute or NOAA or any of these government things, but the problem is we think that we can't be relying on 
funding that comes with strings attached. Yeah, we don't do, want, absolutely we don't, don't want, yeah. Science can't be agenda driven. So unless the agenda is yeah. science. In, in some sense, we don't want money that if people don't understand science or don't appreciate science. That's the whole thing in the in a sense. We really want the hardcore people who believe in science in the way that, that we believe in science. We have our mission statement, blah, blah, blah. But to even expand uh, the, your read, reader's mind is that it's not that we are so you know crazy, want to do this, do that. I mean, Ronan, you just speak on this because we are also working on COVID-19 issues. Yeah, simply because we see that there are many scientific issues are being jumbled up and it's yeah. very confusing, very dangerous. And then people always want to pick side one way or another, all the extreme. But it's nothing about the science. That's the problem. We don't yeah. want science to always be the victim of all this quarrel, all this craziness. You know, and then the IPCC, guess what? I don't really care about IPCC. All I care is that, can we get back to the science? Well, I don't care about Gavin either. Except that when they go too far, you know, I mean, they, they politicize science, they weaponizing their position, you know, the yeah, official right. position. And then COVID is the same problem. We see so many problems. And then that's why we have to jump into the fray a little bit because we think we have something valuable to contribute. Fresh insight, fresh thinking. So we yeah. have a range of expertise, by the way, because not because all of a sudden we really can join this COVID-19. No, 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 no. I studied this issue myself. We, we green grab a lot of our friends, colleagues that understand about the science, you know, microbiologists, one of the names that we can mention is Jerry Quinn. I mean, these are really finest of the good scientists that wanted to, you know, yeah, help us and talk public about health them. specialists and things like yes. that on the COVID uh, front. But it's like, also, we're working on developing sustainable methods of fish farming, wastewater treatment. We're doing a lot of different stuff. So the thing is, what we're interested in I is science and and when Willie was saying he's not interested in the IPCC, I think what he means is we're actually interested in trying to understand how does the climate change? Yes. How, how is it done and why? Like the IPCC gives lip service to it, but they, as Michael explained in the opening, if you go to their about page, they say they, uh, their objective was to provide policymakers with scientific information they can use for developing climate policy. It is their mandate. Yeah, yeah that's their, their their stated goal. And our stated uh, our goal is to find out why, how has the climate changed and why? What are the causes? This is like, you'll hear this thing, um, what a climate denier is like. like what, how do you deny the climate? Really? They say, Climate change. No, you're denying climate. It's like, no, we're looking at climate change, trying to understand it. And people who are throwing these names around, then they're, they, ironically, it seems to be projection, uh, psychological projection, because they're not the ones worth saying, hey, could it be this and this? Could it be mostly human cause, mostly yes. natural, a mixture? Here's different ex scientific opinions. They're like, no, 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 denial, denial. It's, a, it's a, asking questions is considered denial. Asking a, a reasonable question has now become a something bad. That, that's so. Hopefully, more people will stand up at least. I mean, to, to, in the minimal, that I mean, bullying doesn't work. All kinds of intimidation doesn't work. You know, well, it doesn't help science. It's yeah, it doesn't help science. That's the whole problem. And it's true that, sorry, that we use that manual too many times the word science, but we are crazy about science in the sense that we really think that science is very, very valuable tools to actually to get rid of any form of fears, the unjustified fear, you know, superstition, that sort of thing. You know, it's a source, it tested time over time. And this is the most profound human mind that could create, you know, this tool to allow us to elevate ourselves above all kinds of things, cattiness, all kinds of things. It's, it's just so beautiful in that sense. We are after this sort of thing because we are interested. This is why, I mean, for me, it's a good example. I've been taking so much crap that I'm so tired of it. You know what? It had nothing to do with the science in the first place. 
You can call me any name you want. Doesn't matter. I'm still interested in learning why and how. I mean, I really want to know how the irradiance changes, actually. It's a very difficult problem. And we have estimated at least provide a physical bound using observation of sun-like stars. And but then all of a sudden, Gavin Sweet said that all those things already been debunked. But oh, wait, no, oh, yeah, really, really, sorry, I get into that said, again. I know. I, I just I there is, I think there might be a bit of professionality there because he is criticizing. Like you worked with uh, with Dr. Sally Balionas, and so I think Dr. Schmidt was particularly irked by the paper that she did with uh, oh, Bob Jastrow. Jastrow because Bob Jastrow founded the NASA Goddard Institute. And so Gavin is the current director. Current director. So it's possible, but I don't know. Like he, you know, I don't think we should be getting into these. Yes, yes, yes. Right. things about it. But there are read our blog. Read our blog. There, there are different perspectives, different scientific opinions. We welcome diversity of scientific opinion uh, because we're, you know, they they the the saying is. The person who never made a mistake never made anything. So let's try and, you know. Okay, okay. I, I will show you the tattoo sign in my thing. I'm going to turn my clothes. I just yeah. have to stick this off. So <laughs> good enough. But, um, All right. I, I, uh, any other points that you'd like to make before we go I ahead? Think, and I think no. yeah, your, your audience is probably. Well, thank you, Don, for doing what say. you're doing. It's incredible. I mean, what you're doing is very, very good. And uh, again, I, I like your attitude also that you do let us speak. And then I try to say that you are very, very bright. You are the smartest guy that I've seen. You just, you just try to play. You, you know, you're cool. That's it. Thank oh. you. Yeah. Th thank that's you very much. Many people speak their mind. That's, that's good. Thanks, Chop. Okay. Right. Well, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much for all your hey, time. I really appreciate it. All right. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye.